with Ray I Holman. Know, I know the way. He feels somebody's doing that to him every other day. I think he has one of the single most thankless jobs in the state of Michigan these days, especially because of a new concern that he wrote about on Facebook the other day that I think has really uh, su surprised me. This is a pilot program aimed at disabled and elderly people who are receiving a particular kind of care. And I think many of us are familiar with the term of slamming when, you know, you have your natural gas come from consumers and you get a phone call from somebody saying, you know, here, do you want to switch services and we'll save you a lot of, and all of a sudden, if you don't do things quite right, you end up where you don't want to be. Is that what this pilot program is looking at? What is this pilot program all about? <coughs> well, um, excuse me, um, thanks for having me on the show. And um, yeah, what's going on is, with the uh, Department of Human Services, there are approximately 480 adult service specialists, or adult social workers, you could say, and they do three primary things. They investigate adult abuse and neglect. They um, also provide assistance with adult foster care. And the third um, duty or responsibility they have that we're talking about tonight is, is a program called Independent Living Services, or ILS. And what this um, program does, it provides assistance to people that need help maintaining themselves in their own home. And that could be help with activities of daily living, um, a whole host of different things they do. Food, laundry. Food, correct, yes. Shopping. Helping shopping, yeah. bills, you name it, to help you know, people that are um, have some barriers possibly, um, so they can stay in their own home, their own home and they don't need to go to a nursing home. And it's Which called, is so much more effective, affordable, it's what people want. Correct, and a lot of these caseworkers um, that are in the UAW Local 6000 have had relationships with these clients for years and know their families and are very close to them and understand their needs. Um, but what is happening is there's a new program called Michigan Health Link, and it's already started in the UP and South um, West Michigan and what it will do is it's going to passively enroll um, these clients into private companies and I uh, mentioned in the Facebook post that I put on our UAW local page and our, my own personal page it's really an insidious way to outsource important state work because what's happening is this population again that has a lot of barriers with activities of daily living are being mailed a letter and they have to respond to the letter in writing and, and directly indicate back to the department they want to stay with their DHS case worker. That sucks. If they do not <laughs> do... <laughs> that's evil. If yeah, they that's don't wrong. do that, they automatically are um, put into uh, this program. They're slammed into a private <clears throat> program. And again, it's going to be statewide by the end of the, this calendar year. And this particular group of caseworkers that we represent, the adult service specialists, are very passionate. I think I just mentioned to you, they have good relationships with their clients. It's really important work. Um, that you know, they're really upset about this. We did a YouTube video about this at our UAW Local 6000 UAW um, channel. That we, I interview a caseworker and she talks about this. I'm not sure if you guys have had the opportunity I, I've to seen it, yeah. see it. On April 10th, <clears throat> we, we go from DCH. Department of Community Health and Department of Human Services, DHS, to one big department. It's going to be called oh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and that will take place April um, 10th. And, Should have been April 1st for obvious reasons. Oh, right, right. And um, so uh, <coughs> we've been dealing with some layoffs, I think, since the last time I was on your show. We had 100 caseworkers laid off on February 15th. We um, also see that the last week on one of our juvenile justice facilities um, there's a move to close it in the Michigan Senate they want, want to close uh, uh, J.W. Maxie Boyce Training School in Whitmore Lake that does really good work with juveniles. Maxie's one of the few that's left. Correct there's only three there's um and that's one of them and so the Senate wants to close uh, that facility and what's sad about it is it's really a place of last resort for a lot of juveniles. Absolutely. And it prevents a lot of kids, quite frankly, from going to prison. Yeah. And they provide um, specialized treatment. They have um, their own education. They do. They actually do really good work. And so there's a move to close that. So, you know, I'm busy. You mentioned, um, <laughs> do, I, do we feel that we have a lot of challenges and I have a lot of frustrating days? Yes, we do. It's a lot. Of, you know, ongoing concern for us for the UAW Local 6000 is outsourcing. I know I always talk about it 
every time I'm on the show, but it's a constant problem. This stuff is new with the adult program since the last time I was well, on the show. Well, you've been on before. Look at what they've done with Aramark. Boy, there's a brilliant case of outsourcing. I mean, we see the kind of crony capitalism where all of a sudden, instead of doing it through a state system where it's somewhat democratically controlled, people have input, they know that they can write a legislator if they have complaints or concerns, and all of a sudden it goes into the private system, which is a lot more secretive, you know, it's awarding contracts. It's that same neoliberalism that we're talking about, which is this free market capitalism is going to solve everything. And really, if you peel off the profit part of that, it means you have to have diminished services and break the union. You know, that's exactly right. And when broadly, when you're talking about outsourcing, it's, you know, we have proven, I believe anyway, over and over that it does not necessarily save taxpayer dollars. The quality of services diminished. Quite often, it costs greater costs after there's lawsuits and there's more problems. And really, it comes down to... Um, exposing what's going on and that's why it's important to talk about this particular situation on your show tonight and to use social media to, to get our message out um, because I think um, broadly again speaking about outsourcing certain groups see the opportunity to make money off government to make money off taxpayers and they can come in and they try to do that and it's always well this is going to be cheaper and usually what happens is it's cheaper the first two weeks, and then they come back and they have what's called change orders, and 15 oh. million turns into 30 million and 45 million, and all of a sudden it's not cheaper. And um, yeah, so it's it's an ongoing problem that we have. Ray, do you think <clears throat> I've uh, just in the last two or three years have had a relationship with three people who have home care? My mom. Uh, my aunt and a brother-in-law, and I've seen so I've seen a lot of different things going on, and what what's required. And my aunt's 97, still alive. Uh, she manages her own health care, but she's been taken by yes, uh, you know, somebody that ultimately I think she helped put in prison, but they stole from her. And Aww. but I saw a lot of things that they just don't have the expertise to deal with, and I see the mail coming into her place, and it's a lot. <laughs> And if you're not sharp, well, my spouse just got something from Social Security that was almost the same thing you're talking about. Blue Cross is telling you, if you don't sign up today, we're going to you know, end your coverage. Right. right. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think you could do that, really. I just, uh, but, the, I mean, is that kind of letter? Well, the letter said, <laughs> frankly, said on my wife's desk for a week. And the, the, there's a date, a drop dead date is tomorrow. We're seeing more and more of that kind of thing, and it's really frustrating. And I can just imagine, I mean, this is already a clientele that's fragile, often easily confused, sometimes unable to read, may have come from a different a language. Stroke. Uh, they stroke. Should have had a stroke. Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why that's not. So what they're clearly looking at is many of these people would be converted against their will, and they'll be absolutely baffled that this has happened to them. What is their recourse to try to put it back? Well, they have to, again... Um, reach out themselves, you know, to the department and indi indicate, respond to this letter that they, um, and it's their time period too, it's like a 30 day window, and they, and they have to um, respond, otherwise they will, I guess the term is, be passively enrolled with these private um, companies. And again, I use the word insidious, I mean, I think it's a really insidious way to outsource, and some of the caseworkers, um, again, because I've talked to quite a few of them around the state, really are frustrated because this is a population that you know deals with being exploited right and it, you can in some ways say this program is exploiting them um, and that's why we have adult protective services because you have people right. that um, are exploited and and they're um, beaten they're taken advantage and you know right now we have I believe the actual number is 463 adult service specialists and you know the department in the Lansing State Journal and in the Gongwer News Service were, they responded saying well we're not doing this to cut staff you know we're doing this to provide people with more options but Bonnie, we know we've seen the movie before, and the movie is you cut work, and then you come back the next year and say, oh, look, your work is done. We can cut staff. And we also believe that we do a good job with the service. The answer would be, you know, 
um, appropriate enough staff to adequately do the job. That That's the answer. We need more adult service workers. And when you're talking about adult protective services, that's something that's becoming a bigger and bigger high profile responsibility and and um you can see what's coming bigger challenge All of us every day we're yeah. getting up there and, and we are going to be that huge watermelon going through the snake right i mean yeah. you're yeah. going to see us and i've watched uh, the hustle oh. three times by outsourced or not outsourced but private companies they all have marketing agents they're slick let me tell you yeah <laughs> they come in and sit down with you and if you're not even if you know, you're like you're a 50 year old person helping a mother. They're slick. Yeah, they can take you for a ride. You gotta watch them. I don't like this idea too that there's somehow there's this automatic magic in more options. You know what? <laughs> I want more standardization. I mean, even when I get my car, I want to know where to put the key. I want it to be the same place in every car. You don't. Like, I don't want all these options. I mean, if you've got a good service, what do you need another option? You don't for? like the Meyer uh, breakfast cereal aisle. Oh, <laughs> now yeah. there's a lot of options. There's a lot of options, and you know you can go all the way down that sucker and not find one that doesn't have high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> I'm not sure the options are are any better. Yeah. Hmm. It's it's interesting too, and you know it's kind of we been, we smoked them out a little bit. I think if I can be so bold, because you know when the department responded. It, be, it became quite clear to us they've been working on this behind the scenes for a long time. Um, but this was the first we heard of it just a few weeks ago. So here we are, you know, working with our clients. The caseworkers, I've said this many, many times, there's not enough of us. They're overwhelmed. Then all of a sudden you see this come out of left field. And then, you know, we weren't consulted on that, at least not that I'm aware of. I don't believe any of the caseworkers I've talked to were consulted on this. And, um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's not... It, there can be a better way of going about doing this, and I agree with you also when you're saying, when you ever hear stuff like, we're giving you more options, we're going to be more nimble, you know, I always hear these things all the time, but... Nimble gosh. means I'm not going to be getting what I want in two weeks, that's usually what it means, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, so. But yeah. to, to play it out on this very fragile group is not, a, I just think that's kind of wrong. Well, I'm worried about what happens now. I mean, if I get slammed into one of these services, say I'm a person who is uh, suffering dementia, and that's part of the reason that I need to have this kind of care, and I end up in one of these other services, can I then petition to go back to the person I had before? And those are questions I don't know the answer today. And, you know, one of the things, too, the department indicated, again, through the press after the stories ran was that this is a pa this requirement that they be impassively enrolled with these private companies is a federal mandate, which we're trying to figure out where that's coming from or if that there was an IRLS program. So this 20, is twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. So this is not a um, small deal. This is a big deal. Twenty twenty thousand people statewide, and like I said, by the end of the calendar year. Um, unless people actively reach out and say they want to stay with their caseworker, you know, that work is going to be outsourced. And, you know, the other thing, too, is so then that turns the caseworker into somebody who's going around marketing for their own job. Like, hey, you want to stay with me? you got to sign this form. The other He's, thing is when you say they're outsourced, who's going to pick the outsource? Who's well, to, how do those groups get authorized? So they're going to, what's going to happen, so they... The caseworkers themselves aren't necessarily the people that are in the home right. helping somebody right. Right. change yeah. the clothes, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. But they are yeah. putting the programs in and monitoring, monitoring and they yeah. run the case. Make sure they're quality. And they communicate with the families and they set up a plan. Mm -hmm. So the, it's the private company that's going to be taking over that responsibility. So there's if, going to be a big company or maybe several big companies managing lots of little companies. It, I'm not sure. That could be, or it might be a company that actually provides the actual in-home um, personnel, yep. and they might be managing their own people, which, you know, could, again, I don't know if that's going to potentially be some conflicts there or not. I, I'm not sure, to answer your question, how it's actually going to work out, but our caseworkers, you know, they manage the case right now. But they have a lot of direct contact with the families, yep. and they know the families they are they're very involved um you know and one thing i learned it again not to keep um repeating myself but this is a group of caseworkers that are very passionate about their job they're very invested in, in the clients they work with again a lot of them had relationships with people for a long time we've known some of these people bill and they work very hard it is a tough job because oh it's an extremely hard job it's you're trying i mean families are, are facing enormous challenges with these kinds of decisions and they need somebody in there who has a relationship with them yeah absolutely and a lot and it's like it's things 
for example, somebody shows up at their house and says, I can clean your gutters. Right. And then they'll call our caseworker and the caseworker will come over and like, okay, is this person yeah. legit, legit or not? Or, you know, and help them with, or maybe they'll call the family and say, hey, did you know somebody's come by asking your mom if they want to clean the gutters? And, you know, and then they could kind of check it out. So, um, and some people don't have close families. Right. No, they live, yeah. Other states. Both, I mean, geographically and otherwise. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, yeah, it's, I, yeah. Uh, this yeah. is a really fragile group. This is, this is not right. This yeah. is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7. We're talking with the UAW's Ray Holman about the ILS, the Independent Living Service, changes in the structure of that program. And I think it's time to revisit the issue that we always talk about when you're here, which is those Aramark services. One of the things we continue to see is that that program gets into more and more and more hot water. Is there any hope of that being ousted from the prisons and going back to the system we had before, or is that it's very difficult to dislodge one of these changes once they've taken place, isn't it? Well, you know, the, that whole situation is so interesting and disturbing at so many different levels. I mean, it's another fragile population. Yeah, and you know. We represent the UAW Local 6000 uh, on people that provide mental health and physical health in the Department of Corrections. And there was a move a few years ago to outsource all that work. And all I can say is thank goodness that did not happen. And we had hired a um, professor from U of M, Dr. Roland Zolo, who's a research scientist. So we got a team of our professionals, nurses, psychologists, and we ran our own numbers. And we kind of showed that the only way you're going to save money was by providing less care to the prisoners, which causes all kinds of problems, complications if you do that. And they were going to do things like move away from RNs and go to LPNs. And there's all kinds of different ways that really they were providing, again, less care. And that um, situation, unfortunately, they did not, they weren't able to outsource all that work. And then what had happened was they decided to outsource the um, food service portion of mm -hmm. the Department of Corrections. But, you know, food is a big deal in prisons. and only, only thing they have. The so, only thing to look forward to all day long. And so it's just a good example of why outsourcing is so dangerous. And, and it's been, um, you know, documented through me media, chronic problems. And um, I'm not sure what's going to what's gonna happen. I don't know if you saw the person they hired from Florida to come in and monitor the contract, mysteriously left the department, and then the uh, local news service foiled a bunch of emails, and there were some conflicts between the director and this person they brought in from Florida who um, somehow, for whatever reason, uh, mysteriously left just recently. So there's been you know ongoing issues with the, with the whole thing from our perspective. Um, we don't represent the food service workers, that's a different union, but we have a lot of people that work in the facilities and are directly impacted by it. And of course, we're always concerned with moves to outsource more work within the Department of Corrections. And the, the reality is the record speaks for itself. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen what? Maggots in the food. We've seen contraband being brought in by sex, untrained staff. Repeatedly. Sex, yeah, I mean. And clearly, I mean, people are watching now and paying close attention to what's happening because they're concerned about it, but they've, been, they've certainly found scandals that they're reporting. Well, I think one of the things that kind of people are not maybe realizing is the amount of pressure on state governments now in a way that there wasn't before. The increase in the number of lobbyists, the efforts to outsource almost everything. As the scrutiny of the federal government went up, and uh, at the same time our, the number of journalists goes down, uh, the actions move to the states. I mean, there's a lot more that you can do there to manipulate and get changes made in systems um, that fly in on the radar because we don't have enough reporters to be able to keep track of what's happening. Thank goodness we have you telling us on social media what's going on. Well, it's, it's really true. And, you know, unfortunately, the big multi-client lobbyists around town, and, you know, I bump into them, and a lot more, you know, quite honestly, friendly people, but they're very powerful people. Beyond belief, and no one hardly and they're, knows they're, it. And they, and unfortunately, because of term limits, lawmakers depend on a lot of times the multi-client lobbyists because they understand what's going on because they've been around for 30 years and they're very well connected themselves. And you mentioned there's less and less reporters down there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, a, it is a concern right now. And I also think that a lot of stuff happens at the state level and I think big political 
powerful groups and people have figured that out and they've moved in and they're really um, they you see this these this legislation that's identical from state to state. Alec, the American Legislative Exchange a lot of the right to writes work all stuff. of that in concert with the lobbyists. In, in, and uh, the, it's boilerplate that they send around from all correct. the Correct. It's why what we're seeing with the same bill that Mike Pence, the governor of Indiana, is now in big trouble for the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act that just passed in Indiana was up here in Michigan and they keep making periodic stabs to try to get it passed here in Michigan. It's the same bill going around the state. I mean the, these different states are tipping over and adopting these policies and people don't realize it's much harder to have that state level control. Yeah it is and also you know the pressure um, I mentioned this before on the show as a regular frontline caseworker is really it's a difficult job and um, it, there's these huge software programs that take all the um, discretion away from the frontline employer, the frontline caseworker, and they're constantly um, ha having problems. They're constantly system errors. There's constantly fixes that need to be Think made. Think of Obamacare. Right, and right. That's what they're like. Yeah. And it's really difficult, and it's made the jobs very challenging, and there's a lot of pressure. And also, you know... And I'm not the first person to say that, but you can really see where state employees are set up to fail. When we talked about the adult service, I just got done telling you guys there's 463 workers, and I just told you there's 20,000 people in the ILS program, and that's just one of three things they do. Remember, they also investigate adult abuse and neglect, and they also manage um, adult foster care. And so... Um, you know, again, the answer is not taking the work away, but it's appropriately staffing the, de the departments. Um, closing Maxi uh, Boys Training School, not a good idea. We used to have so many facilities, and the argument was many of these kids would be better treated in the community, which was true. And the idea was we would leave Maxi open for the kids, really severely difficult kids to deal with. There's no other place for them, and it's not safe to have them in the community. But look at what happens when you put them in a, the adult system. They become prey for the adults, so Co you don't want that. Correct. There's not a lot of youth in the three facilities. As a matter of fact, I think there's like 90. There's three facilities okay. we have left. There's Bay Pines up in the UP, mm -hmm. Shawano Center in Grayling, and then a Maxi here in Whitmore Lake. And there's not that many, but the kids that are there, it's a place of last resort. It's Again, it's a place... Probably prison's the next stop, and a lot of them are at the age where they could be in prison, Quite to be quite frank, blunt with you. And um, they do a good job in these facilities. And there's not, they don't have the private facilities that are appropriate for these kids. And see, the kids they have, they don't make money for the private facilities because, they, ah. because they're difficult. And the one thing, too, when you're talking about the private, they cherry pick cases. So a lot of the more difficult uh, cases that the state handles are not ones you can make money off because you have to put so much resources So when you them. say last resort, you mean last resort. These are Correct. kids who really have nowhere to go. Yeah. Other yeah. than into this, the adult yeah. system, which is always a problem. Yeah. Well, you know, Ray, I'm so glad that you come and keep us surprised of this because I think what we're seeing is this sort of shift to outsource everything and we've got to keep an eye on this and we don't have very many people to do it. Thank you for coming and joining us. We hope to have you back again soon. 